going to uh, start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're going to call the meeting to order, and we will start with roll call. We'll just start here at the front table. Sarah Darting. Christy Van Meter. Lauren Tace Miller. Tim Halsey. Rosa Cavazos. Rocky Busnitz. Christina Flaming. Sarah Sanders. Uh, moving on to approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. moved by Christina, seconded by Sarah. All in favor? 6-0. And approval of our minutes from our April 1st, 2024 regular meeting. Do I have a motion for approval? Moved, Moved by Christy, seconded by all second. Christina. All in favor? 6 0. Communications, student recognition, Mrs. Avery Bears. Good evening. Um, I am Avery Ayersberry, and I teach the drawing, graphic design, and principles of illustration classes at Shawnee Heights. And I wanted to thank, um, welcome all of you guests, and thank the school board for allowing me to come tonight. I have the opportunity to recognize the extraordinary achievements of Katie Eller on behalf of the USD 450 School Board. Her high school journey exemplifies the essence of art and excellence, community and community engagement. Her talent and determination have earned her numerous accolades, including multiple gold and silver keys at the Eastern Kansas Scholastic Art Awards. Her accomplishments speak volumes about her artistic brilliance and dedication to her craft. Tonight, I am pleased to recognize her for having her work titled Missing Sisters accepted in the 2024 National Art Honor Society juried exhibit. Over 2,700 works of art were submitted across the country and only 125 were accepted. Katie is the only student in Kansas represented in this elite show. Katie, we are immensely proud of you and your contributions you have made to the district and community. Congratulations on a well-deserved recognition. Board members, if we can go up front and have Katie come through and Katie, I am so extremely proud of you and so happy that you could be here this evening. The artwork that was accepted um, is one of my favorites. And I was like, how do I get a commissioned piece of that artwork? Because I absolutely love it. So congratulations.
are we able to ask questions to Mrs. Berry? Yeah, sure. Sure, sure Christina. When she's done smiling for her pictures. Can you get, I've seen these pictures in central office in the conference room. Can you give your background on the one that's going to the competition? Uh, this, uh, this piece was a dedication to the missing and murdered indigenous women movement. Um, a lot of women, indigenous women specifically, have been disappearing across the country from their reservations with um, almost no trace. And there's not been a whole lot being done about it. And this was a piece just to w raise awareness. And the red handprint on my friend's mouth represents the women that have been disappeared, basically. And this was my, that was my idea for the piece. Thank you. I think human trafficking is a huge issue with women, children, all kinds of people disappearing. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Mrs. Berry for all of your work with our students and the art program. So you've really just made an impact on, on all of our students. And so we can't thank you enough for your dedication that you have and, and seeing their artwork out at the library and out at Washburn and just everywhere. It's amazing. I am so proud of what you've done. So thank you for your dedication. All right, moving right along, uh, we have our Shawnee Heights Elementary Site Council report. Well, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Shawnee Hayes, principal of Shawnee Heights Elementary. And before we get started with our presentation, I want to give a shout out to our PTO for providing a wonderful meal for you all. So PTO, thank you so much for that wonderful meal. Appreciate that. At this time, I would like our site council members to come up. They're going to introduce themselves, and either they're a staff member um, or a parent, or maybe both. So they're going to come on up and introduce themselves. They were nervous. I'm not. <laughs> well, maybe I am. Um, I'm Lisa Taylor. I'm a first grade teacher here at Shez, but I also have two hats. Um, I have a graduate. Um, of Shawnee Heights District. I also have a junior in high school, and then I have a fifth and sixth grader at Shez as well. Hi, I'm Michael Schmidt, uh, site council. I have two daughters. One's a second grader here at school, and the other one's at home, obviously. She's only one. So uh, I'm also known as coach, so I coach uh, all the second graders, well, many of them, and, and basketball and soccer. So I'm Dee Tomlin. Um, I have a sixth grader here, so sad that he'll be leaving and I'll have to drive by myself to work every day. But um, so I'm also a para working on year number six here at Shez for the site council. Hi, I'm Christina Collins, and I have a sixth grader here at Shez. Hi, I'm Andrea Christian, and I have a second grader, Owen, that goes to the school here, and I'm also part of the um, PTO as secretary. Hi, I'm Tracy Holder. I joined Lisa on the first grade dream team. Um, also, I am a parent. Uh, I have two kids here at uh, Shez, um, second grader and a first grader, and then I have a kindergartner. We go to Roundup, um, well, upcoming kindergartner. We go to Roundup Thursday, and then I have a two-year-old at home as well. Good evening. I'm Sherry Fleming, and I'm the counselor here at Shez. And I'm Andrew Singleton, assistant principal. Can we give our site councils a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you all for being here. They didn't want to come up. All right, so um, we just have a very short, but I hope informative presentation for you. Um, myself, Mr. Singleton, Ms. Bloxham, our social worker, and Ms. Fleming, our counselor. So we will start with 
Our mission and our purpose of Shawnee Heights Elementary School. So we see there on the left side our mission statement, Shawnee Heights Elementary School, Pettit Building, staff and families provide a safe and supportive environment that ensures academic excellence and develops productive, responsible, and respectful citizens prepared for a lifetime of learning in a dynamic society. We, we live that, we breathe that, we try to make sure we are challenging our students each and every day. Our purpose statement, and this is so important because this really goes along with our presentation tonight. Shawnee Heights Elementary School will implement a tiered intervention plan to support the academic, behavior and our social needs of all of our students. So as we go through this, I want you to think about our purpose statement and how it relates back to our presentation. At SHES, we have these school-wide expectations, and if you work in Shawnee Heights or are a parent of Shawnee Heights, you know these eight keys of excellence. And we say these every morning in our morning announcements. Teachers go over them when they need to do any recorrection or when they are um, praising a student. Integrity, failure leads to success. Speak with good purpose. We say that one quite a bit. This is it, commitment, ownership, flexibility, and balance. So that's what we live by every day, and it's really not just a school setting. I was talking to a parent this weekend um, over our spring festival, and she was using the failure leads to success at home, and her child said, Mom, don't say that to me. That's a school thing. It's really not. It's a lifelong failure leads to success, and as adults, we live that as well every day. So what I want to show you next is our um, social-emotional learning goal. Um, through KISA, we had two goals. One was reading, and one was social-emotional. And our presentation tonight is really going to focus on our social-emotional goal. So by the end of the 24-25 school year, which when we started this a couple years ago, that seemed so far away, Guess what, it's next May. Um, students will show improvement and engagement in learning as a result of their ability to manage their emotions, thoughts, and behaviors as demonstrated by a 10% in increase in scoring on the building data matrix. So we use our sabers. <clears throat> I know that's really hard to see, but I want you to notice the graph on the left is our fall um, data. The top part, the purple, we had 81% in our low risk on our Saber screener. We had 19% in that some risk, high risk. We do the screener three times a year, so at the winter time, which was right before our holiday break, our low risk jumped to 83%. That's a good thing. So we are seeing less students in that high risk category. And so now we have 17% in that some risk and that high risk category. We will do another screener. Um, the window actually just opened today, but we're gonna give our students a little bit of a break because we are just finishing state assessments. So we will do that probably beginning mid-May. When we look at our goal, we're gonna demonstrate a 10% increase. I'm gonna be honest, that's gonna be a little hard to reach that goal because we are already at that 81, 83%. It's a good problem to have, but we have room to grow, right? Um, if we think about that matrix, we want that top tier, the tier one, to be our low risk, and we're kind of already there. So the reason why we're doing this presentation is we have some work to do, and we have some things in place that we're gonna put in place, that we have put in place this year and, and next year. So next year at this time, I can't wait to report to you how that's going. So. Um, thinking about this school, thinking about we still have work to do, but we're really in a good place. There's always room for improvement. We're going to talk a little bit about our CI3T plan, our Comprehensive Intervention Tiered Support System, and then that's going to bring you into an amazing grant we received. Our staff don't really know about this yet, so if they're watching, they're going to find out, and you all that are here, um, we got this wonderful grant, so we can't wait to share that with you. So next up is Ms. Fleming. She is going to talk about our CI3T, Comprehensive Integrated Three-Tiered, that's a mouthful. That's why we say CI3T, um, our model of prevention. So just to fill you in a little bit with this model of prevention, it is the way that we support the social-emotional learning at SHES. And um, it's a prevention model, of course, and it has three integrate, um, integrated areas, academics, behavior, and social skills. 
Um, we promote positive interactions and school-wide expectations, and students can earn tickets, which I brought one this evening. They can earn these tickets when they demonstrate these. The first area is academics, and we focus on proactive strategies to support engagement. One of those is by instructional choice, and that's offering students um, and providing them more than one choice, so two or more options, so that they can independently choose from for their learning. Another one is instructional feedback, and that is when teachers are providing uh, timely feedback to clarify or confirm any concepts that they have. And then the last one is opportunities to respond, and that's a strategy that increases responses by allowing multiple occasions for the students to answer. Our second area is behavior, and this is a proactive strategy to support behavior, of course, and behavior-specific praise is, is really a big part of CI3T. Um, it is where you're giving tickets for uh, very specific reasons so the students know why they're getting this ticket. So for instance, on here it says uh, showing respect is one of them. That's something that you would um, tell the student when you're giving that to them. Thank you for showing respect uh, to the other classrooms in, when you're quiet in the hallway or as you're quiet in the hallway. Pre-correction, so reminding students of expectations before they are, enter an environment or before they uh, begin an activity. Active supervision, so supervising students in all areas at all times. Safe space, that would be in the classroom. It's kind of like a calm down um, area that the students can go and it helps to regulate them and de-escalate when they're upset. And then a buddy classroom is a specific classroom that is um, a positive for kids. It's a kind of a positive timeout, but a non-punitive break uh, that they can go into a classroom and it just helps them to regain some self-control while the classroom is, is doing their activities. Then area three are social skills. So teachers demonstrate and teach the eight keys of excellence and they acknowledge students when they are demonstrating those as well. We have our second step curriculum, which all the teachers teach, um, and that helps the students to build social emotional skills. And then student, our teachers also maintain regular communication with parents regarding the social emotional health of and the needs of their student. And this is an example of um, what is in our office. We have our tower, which is to the right, uh, full of tickets. And then on the left side, it has, if you can see, it has buckets kindergarten through sixth grade. And so we have our tower and then our grade level buckets. So every Thursday, um, the students know to bring the tickets down if they haven't already. So those are filled. And then a ticket is drawn from each grade level bucket. And they, uh, the, the student that's drawn can go to Mrs. Hayes' office and get a prize for that day. And then all of those tickets are then put into that big tower that you see. And there are lines on the tower. If you can see, there's two dark lines and then one middle uh, yellow one. The dark lines signify um, a reward such as a hat day, like a, a staff and student hat day or pajama day. And then the middle yellow one is where they can earn a treat day, so popsicles or popcorn. So just some extra recognition that we give the students. Um, and those equate to about one a quarter, so thereabouts. So. so this year we received the Martin Family Grant here at Shez. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's an opportunity through our foundation to uh, get $4,000 that will affect an entire school. So last year I worked with, she's actually here tonight, Mrs. Stevenson, uh, the music teacher at South, and last year South was able to add a whole bunch of musical instruments and some really cool things for their program. This year I collaborated with this awesome team, and we are going to be bringing uh, Shez Sensory Wellness to our building. Uh, what that's going to look like. I'll talk about here in a second, but we're doing it um, in an attempt to support the academic, behavioral, and social needs of all students. Shawnee Heights Elementary will create spaces in which students can regulate and have alternate, alternative workspace areas. Currently, we have one room in our building. It's kind of a smaller closet-like room, a small office room um, that has a variety of these tools in it. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that our students have the opportunity to regulate themselves within their classrooms. Uh, we know that when students spend more time in class, when they're in the classroom, they're accessing that instruction and working with, you know, whether they're taking a break 
or whether they're sitting at their desk, if they're in the classroom, they're more likely to be able to absorb and engage with that instruction later on down the road. So we are bringing in um, a bunch of resources that I'm gonna show you here in a second. Um, the, one of them is this, I don't even know how you say this, Milliard crash pad, but it's a gigantic crash pad. If you've, got, if you've been at Tecumseh North, they have this in their Panthers den. Um, this will be put into our office, a smaller room. So we won't have one of these in every classroom, but we will have one of these in the building. Um, this sensory sequin wall will be in that smaller room and we'll have LED bubble tubes throughout the building in different places. We'll have a bunch of TheraPutty that will be distributed throughout the entire school. Each classroom will have TheraPutty. There'll also be TheraPutty um, that can be accessed in that wellness room that we currently have. Each classroom teacher will receive stress balls and then weighted stuffed animals. I use the weighted stuffed animals in my practice as an assistant principal almost daily. It's really cool to, to see how kids gravitate towards those, whether they're kindergarten or just sixth graders. They always like grabbing onto those and holding them. It really seems to de-escalate a situation and gives them, you know, um, some nice, you know, feedback while they're trying to de-escalate. Um, storage baskets, that's not exciting, but every teacher needs a storage basket uh, to put all this stuff in. Um, they'll have some sand timers that will be based off of certain amounts of time. Um, beanbag chairs for every classroom. Um, Play-Doh for every primary grade teacher. Um, I, I guess I talked about the TheraPutty. The TheraPutty will be at the intermediate level. So third grade and up will have the TheraPutty, whereas primary students will have Play-Doh. Our expert over here, Sarah Bloxham, uh, <laughs> encouraged that, plus Play-Doh's cheaper than TheraPutty, so that works out pretty well. Uh, so Shez's next steps. Um, is that you, Ms. Bloxham? All right, so that's what we're bringing in. Now, Ms. Bloxham. So the other really neat piece to this is we're going to have this room or this space that can be used um, for to model um, to model for teachers to bring back to their spaces. But in addition to loop in these sensory items and to bring in buy-in from teachers, we're actually going to teach them how to use the tools by allowing them to design them. They're going to be developing sensory diets for their children in their classroom for what they need, and then in turn teaching students how to do that. So we're going to really increase, um, I, I want to encourage a little bit of every PD to either have a workshop where we make four different sensory tools and, and talk about why we're using them. Um, we're going to be building in, so having those workshops for there, it's really hands-on and that buy-in, um, and then hopefully that goes down into the classroom. So there's things that aren't always going to cause money. Um, so, for example, well, we are going to get the Play-Doh, but Play-Doh is really fun to make for children. I used to make it all the time with my mother, and that's one of the things that I remember. So those things, we're going to talk about doing that, the sensory bottles, um, all hands-on learning. Then the next piece to this for the professional development is the care team is going to continue to provide trauma-informed professional development to our staff. And trauma-informed care um, came from the neuro, so this, it's, a, it's a practice. It's not necessarily a curriculum. It's a model for how we approach students and social-emotional learning and emotional regulation. So Bruce Perry is a creator of the Children's Stress Network. He's done lots and lots of um, practice with children and families that have gone through trauma. Um, and so he has a variety of videos, and you can actually find them on, is for the, P it's a PBS, um, it's public, yeah, yeah, it's on the, it's on a public access, so it's every teacher can sign up and get these. The videos run in series of about five video sessions for each series, and we did one series this last semester with members of our BLT. There's a second series coming out, and some of the examples of these five minutes, sometimes five to eight minute presentations 
The second series has a couple longer ones, 15 minutes. Um, but these are the titles of some of the things that we're going to be looking at. And so incorporating professional development with those sensory item tools, um, more education for educators on how to use those tools, and recognize emotion in themselves and in children and how to coach those through, um, they're all going to be incorporated as one. And it's not going to be necessarily a destination that we send them to to get it together and come back. What we really want to do is incorporate this throughout our building, um, and it really can start in the classroom. And the hypothesis is we're going to have um, much lower results of misbehavior or classroom disruption if we're allowing these practices to, to come from within the classrooms. That's all we have. We are excited um, for all of our tools that we're going to order this summer, and teachers will have them in the classrooms, again, giving some training. And um, we gave the Dr. Perry videos to all of our staff on a PD day, but some of them were that amazing letters training. But I sent that out for them to just look at on their own and got lots of feedback, like these were really great videos. So we will continue that training. Um, Mrs. Bloxham, she's just got a lot of knowledge on um, the neuroscience of trauma, so we're looking for her expertise. That's all we have. Can we answer any questions or any clarifications from my team? Yes, ma'am. So I was the fifth child out of seven, and sometimes you didn't get much attention, so if you acted poorly, you got attention. So is there a plan, or, I mean, you've studied this and I haven't, so is there a plan to award the good children, some of the same things, so that they don't feel like the children causing problems or disruptions, that they get these rewards for that behavior and to make sure that the children don't see this as a reward for poor behavior? So will the good kids get like more than just a gold ticket? Will they get to do some of the fun stuff like so that they aren't encouraged to be naughty to get these fun things. So they're all great kids, and sometimes they make bad, poor decisions. And that's how we phrase it always with students and with parents. They're great kids. Just like we're great adults, sometimes we make poor decisions. Um, we encourage all of our students, and we'll, that's one of the training we will let our staff know, um, especially when you get new tools, you just want to play with it, you want to manipulate it. We will have that exploration time for all the students. Um, and then in the classroom, anybody can go in that safe space. It might even, it might even be a teacher. Be like, I need a minute. Let me go sit down. Um, but we want them to know it's okay. You got to feel those feelings, and we would rather you do it in a safe space environment. And we've talked about quantum change of state. If they need to leave, that's why we have buddy rooms. That's why we're going to have that sensory room with the bigger movement type of things. Um, we give each kid whatever they need. Always. And so, you know, with the CI3T tickets, we're always giving that positive praise. And that's why we switched a little bit this year for that tower. That's a new thing that we started because we wanted that positive to be building wide instead of just a few select students. So we wanted the whole building and even the staff, they get that popcorn, that popsicle hat day um, because it's all of us. It takes all of us to run a, a successful, effective school. Thank you. Yep. Can you share a little more about what the buddy room? is sure so when students if um if they're just needing a change of state if they're just having kind of a moment we don't know how students come in the morning if they've had a bad moment at home right just kind of like us adults if we've gotten behind a really slow car and we're heading to work and we need to get there um, you can kind of tell students as soon as they walk in the door if they're needing a moment so the teachers are really good at recognizing that and sometimes they just ask hey do you need a minute do you need a change of environment Usually they buddy up with the grade level so that they're still hearing that content so that we're not, you know, putting a sixth grader with a kindergartner. We, we try to avoid that. We try to put them right next to someone they're very familiar with and that same grade level so they're still getting some instruction. But really, if they're needing a buddy room, their amygdala is firing, nothing's really going in, we just want them to take a break. And so their first option is a buddy room and then if that's really not what's working for them, 
They can come to the office for a break, and we tell the students that you're just up here for a break. You're not in trouble. You just need to change. Um, you know, we need to get your body regulated, your emotions regulated. We've got sensory paths. We, we might take them on a walk around the building. Yeah. Yep. Anyone else? Absolutely. Um, as you're doing the, you talked about doing the like building wide PD trainings for the sensory tool and then the Dr. Perry videos, are you including the paras that are working with the kiddos as well? So our paras are only on duty the, during those PDs at the beginning of the year. Um, so that's why I sent it out to all staff, hoping that maybe our paras could have an opportunity to watch those videos. Next year, um, I think with one of our PD days, we are going to really, when we have them all, because I like having all of them for this important information, yes, we're going to make sure we have this information with our entire staff because it's so important. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? This is very exciting. Thank yes, you. Thank I had you. no idea about the um, weighted stuffed animals. Mm -hmm. So that sounds really cool. I might have to get one of those. And then the wall with the sequins, I can totally see myself at work using yes. that too. So um, yes. yes. That's my favorite. I have a pillow in my office with that sequin stuff and not just the kids use it. I'm just yeah. saying it's, it's really um, calming. You just rub it up and down and you make designs in it. And so we all have yeah. those days and the led bubble tubes. Yes. That just sounds like fun just to sit there and read a book. Yes. Um, so thank you. Congratulations yes, thank on you. the grant. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you to the foundation for providing that for you. Um, this is exciting. And maybe, sir, if you haven't seen the room um, after the meeting, if you wanted to go Absolutely. check out the room, we got to see it a couple of times. So some of us have seen it. But for those of you that haven't, it's really cool Perfect. to go in and, and relax. So, yeah. Thank you all Thank you for all. being here. And if, if you don't want to stay for the entire meeting, please don't. You don't have to stay. You're welcome to leave. But um, And thank you again for dinner. It was delicious. Thank you. Appreciate your time. All right. We have no comments or concerns from patrons that signed up. Um, so we're going to move on to business by consent. What? We do have... Oh, did I miss... I did. I'm so sorry. And I always love what you have to say. So I apologize. We have Dr. O'Brien who's going to talk about special education headcount. That's not a problem. You didn't hurt my feelings. Okay. Thank right. you. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this. Oh, am I in the community room? That would be my problem. Okay, let me try that again. All right. As you know, our um, annual count actually happens on December 1st for special education. It's not um, the same as our 920 count, which takes all of our kids into account and they use that number for multiple um, reasons and funding and that kind of thing. But special education counts take place every year on December 1. And so I try to make sure that we um, get our December 1 count as finalized as possible before we uh, present that to you, but that's what I'm going to do this evening. Okay, if you can um, see the screen, but I also believe you have a copy, uh, you can tell that last year we had a total of 748 students um, receiving special education and gifted services. So this includes 97 um, students this year that are uh, receiving gifted. It's down. Does everybody see the little downward trend or the uh, mark? Actually, we're down um, nine students, and I'll show you how that um, where those students have come from and, and what that looks like. Among these 739 students, um, as I said, I'll let you look at that graph a little bit, but 
Gifted is 97. So when we're thinking about students receiving special education services, we have those students, and then we have students that receive gifted, and they're not really, um, they're not the same kiddos, obviously, although we have some that overlap. But in Kansas, in the state of Kansas, gifted students fall under special education. So we call them as exceptional students, so it's special education and exceptional students. So, um, so 97 of, uh, students are in the gifted program. We still have our highest numbers under learning disabilities. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and our speech and language, if you go over toward the um, right-hand side of your, of your chart there, SL is speech and language. And those um, numbers don't re represent every student our speech and language pathologists see. There are 90 students that receive speech and language services only. So that means they go and spend 20 minutes two times a week with our sp speech and language pathologist, but they don't receive any academic um, uh, services from a special ed teacher. In addition to those 90 students, um, our speech and language pathologists also see some special education students um, that also need speech and language services but their primary disability is not going to be speech and language because they get academic services too. So when I tabulated all of the students that our SLPs touch, right, all of the students that they see comes out to be 505 students. So that 90 only represents the um, students that are speech language only students, okay? And I think that's important because our speech language pathologists work really hard and I want them to, um, I want to represent that with our numbers. Okay, as you can see, um, our largest numbers are K through six. Um, and uh, next would be our nine through 12 and then our seven through eight. So that all makes sense. Do you have any questions about this uh, chart? Um, when we look down here, you can see what the different exceptionality labels are. Um, do you have any questions about that so far? Or what the different exceptionalities mean? So you might have said this and it just... It's okay. So if you have a pre-K child that's in the autism box... Yes. They're only represented there even if they have speech and language. Correct. They would only be represented in one box regardless of whatever their exceptionality is. Correct. Okay. So, so we always, our primary disability is always going okay. to be the um, academic or emotional, social emotional piece. Okay. SL, uh, any related service is going to be your speech language, um, OT, PT, and okay. those aren't represented in there. So 739 is unique students, but not necessarily representative of the amount of services we're providing. Correct, okay. exactly right. Okay. That's exactly Thank it. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. But we do have six that have multiple disabilities. Yes, so those could be um, uh, orthopedically impaired, but they also have a vision and hearing um, impairment. Um, so those students have multiple, um, get multiple services, but in a larger number of services. Does that make sense? Okay, developmental delay, the DD right here. Remember, those are the students that we identify early between the ages of three and eight, and we're, they're showing delays in, cert, in specific areas, and we're trying to do some things um, to try to uh, remediate those delays before we actually qualify them in one of the more specific areas. So we wanna make sure that if a student um, has a learning disability, that they actually have a learning disability and it's not because um, they haven't had proper exposure, right, to, to um, those uh, concepts. Um, we wanna make sure a student does have an intellectual delay. So we're going to do some things early on to make sure that our testing is valid um, and make sure that we expose them to specific skills. Um, so we use that DD label all the way at, up to age eight, and at age eight, we reevaluate those students, and we are hopeful then that we, uh, they do not qualify for special education in a specific area. But those that do, we then add on the service that they, the label that they most represent. 
Quick question. So do you have any statistics for students who fall off of you know, that the is, chart? I should. I should have those. I don't have those in the December 1 count. Okay. So, but that is a really good question, Christina, and, uh, and I'm interested to know what those are this year. So I'll try to find those and send them to you. Okay. Um, they just aren't represented in the December 1 report that I pulled. So it's a really good question, though. Okay. And I'm, I'm, it's not as, it's not as, um, it's not as few as we'd like, which tells us two things. One, um, well, one of the things is that we're identifying students early, but it may be a very good and valid representation of what they need, right? Um, but we'd like to see more students fall off for AJ. Okay, let's see. All right, so this is a bar graph. Um, this is where I wanted to show you the number, um, remember that our total number reduced by nine students. So the biggest drop was in our speech and language students, speech and language only. Um, it went from 110 to 90, so that's 20 students. We have been really focused in the area of speech and language, um, emphasizing that we do not um, provide a clinical model, okay, something, um, speech services that you might find outside of the school setting because the, um, when we're focused on a school setting, their speech and language has to impact their ability to learn in the classroom, right? So if, um, if you are able to be understood, have proper articulation that can make you, um, that you can be understood and express your needs and, and wants, then that may not be impacting you in the, in the educational setting. But it might, you might be a student that out in the clinical setting or out in the uh, community setting you would qualify to receive or your parents may want to um, seek out speech services for you. It's a difference. So we've been really focused on what is an educational model. So the 20 students that, um, that we've uh, reduced, we are hoping that those are the students, because we've really been focused on this too, that have made enough progress that they are now, um, not, it's not impacting their educational performance, and we are dismissing them from speech and language services, because we tend to try to hold on to our kiddos, right? Um, and uh, we're working on dismissing as well. So that's an area we've been working on, so I was pleased to see that. Um, so that was 20 students, but unfortunately we do see an increase in some areas, small, but when you add them up across the board, they do um, make up for those other 11. Um, so we saw an increase in um, ID, which was really interesting, only by about five students, intellectual um, delay. We've seen an increase in LD again. You'll notice this graph starts at 2020 and goes through 2023, December 1st, 2023. This was around the time of COVID, right? And we see an increase. We're concerned about that because we wanna make sure that we are identifying students that have a true disability and not a learning loss due to COVID, right? So we continue to work on ways to identify or, or make the distinction for students. If they are students that were younger when they were, and they were already in school, um, and we have some uh, baseline data of what we looked like before COVID, then that makes it easier, right? Because we can see, were they behind before COVID, and now we're still behind or we're slipping further behind? But when we're talking about littles who either weren't in school at the time of COVID or um, missed their kindergarten year, it's really hard, right, to determine whether it's a learning disability or learning loss due to COVID that we're trying to make up. So again, we're seeing that um, increase there um, over the last four years, um, well, over the last three years, um, by 32 students, which is the most significant gain here. Do you have any questions about the bar graph? Christina. Not about the bar graph itself, but a quick question that just sure. popped in my mind. Have you seen any correlation between us going to the science of reading, the teachers getting trained in letters, any change correlating that to improvements in speech and language with the students? Mm. Probably not even something that even 
there's any data crunch. Probably but. not any data. Um, I know we were very concerned coming out of COVID, even with our speech and language kids, right? Because we had masks on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't, I'd have to talk with my speech and language pathologists. I have not heard that from them. That does not mean they're not seeing that. Yeah. Um, I can tell you a little bit more. Do you have any other questions about the bar graph? Okay. I always like to come in and say, we have this number of students. How many of these students came to us with an IEP, having a disability already? How many of these students um, did we identify ourselves, right? Um, so in 20, uh, last year, December 1st, 2022, we had 47 students that transferred into the district with an IEP. This year we had 70. Last year, we um, had 13 students transfer out of our district with an IEP. This year, six. And this is as of December 1, so you have to remember it's August through, through December. Um, in terms of new referrals, so these are students that of ours that we looked at, put through our general ed intervention process, and then made the determination that we needed to do a more formal evaluation. Last year, we did, um, had 30 new referrals by 12-1. However, 11 of those were early childhood, and we screen monthly to try to pick up those students. Plus, we have students that come from TARC and transition, right? So 11 of those were early childhood, which means 19 were school-aged children that we referred and then identified. This year, um, we have 29 new identifications, 18 of which was early childhood, and 11 were school age. So when you're looking at that, I like to look at the number minus our early childhood students because we're looking for those kiddos on a monthly basis and they come from TARC. So last year we identified 19 K-12 students um, by December 1, and this year we have 11 by December 1, which is a good thing, right? Because we're not seeing students with the delays that um, we did last year or we're not um, uh, needing to evaluate those students because they're making progress with ge general ed intervention. All right. Any questions that I can answer now? Okay, if not, if you have a question later, um, you can uh, email me and I'll try to find out the data or the information for you. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of your hard work and the team's hard work, because we know they do a lot. They do. They're very hardworking, and our related services folks um, are exceptional, And um, but they'll appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Now, moving on, we have no comments or concerns from patrons, so thank you. And let me get out of the screen. All right. Action items. Business by consent. Do I have a motion? Second. Moved by Christina, seconded by Rocky. All in favor? Six zero, thank you. Um, approve Kansas Educational Risk Management Pool updated bylaws. Is that Sarah? Yes. She's feverishly <laughs> writing. So these changes in the bylaws just represent how the pool is operating today. They haven't made any changes in the bylaws since we joined in the last three years. So if you have questions for the pool, I can forward them and get your answers. I didn't get any emails prior to the meeting. So, um, but if you have no concerns, we have no concerns and we recommend approval. Do I have a motion to approve? Moved by Lauren. Do I have a second? Seconded by Rocky. All in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Um, approve 2024-2025 resource and participation fees. Mr. Hallisey. We work, uh, have worked really hard to try and hold the line on, on the cost that we pass along to families. Um, it's been a tremendous challenge, especially the last two years. Uh, with the rate of inflation and we've absorbed a lot of cost 
Um, we've tried to do that through efficiencies and, and, and other things. Um, and while we're able to hold the line on most of those costs, we, we do need to pass along a, a small increase of $5 for class fees in K-6 and then textbook and digital resources um, across the district. That, that's just a $5 increase that will help us keep cost uh, up with cost um, as we start to renew uh, and, and update some of our resource materials across the district. So that'll help us keep pace with at least some of that. Um, but other than that, we're still continuing to hold the line on that and we'll continue to try and do that moving forward. Uh, hopefully we'll get some relief as uh, some of the inflationary cost and drivers start to come down over the next year or two. So, uh, but we recommend approving that small increase for next year. I'd be glad to entertain questions. Were we doing any increase or charging parents for the credit card fees? I know we absorbed that um, the past two years, maybe? I, I'd have to check for sure, but I'm nearly positive we do not charge any um, credit card fees to parents when they, you're talking about when they use their credit right. card to pay for mm -hmm. their fees. Yeah, no, I don't believe we're charging okay, anything. Okay, I, I thought that was right, so I just wanted to make sure we were going to continue with that as well. Do we have a motion to approve? Rosa, I have a question. Oh, absolutely, sorry. Can you remind us, I feel like last year we increased fees by $5. Am I not remembering that correctly? I know for a while we kept it flat, but then I feel like last year we increased it. And Mrs. Bell is kind of a historian on these. Yeah. She might be able to provide some light. There were a couple of class fees at the high school that we had to increase, like the woods, because the, mm -hmm, right. the increase of the product was so much more. And then I can't remember if it was last year or maybe a year before, but recently we had a $5 fee for like a class fee for the high school that they use for um, activities. And I can't exactly remember what those are, but it was for like the class of 23, the class mm -hmm. of 24, there's a small little fee that we use for some of those things. And we did increase that by $5 recently, but we have not uh, updated the textbook fee for the five years I've been here, I know for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Sorry, any other questions? Do we have a motion? Rosa, I hate to do it, but inflation is what it is, so I will make a motion. Moved by Christina. Do I have a second? Moved by, or seconded by Christy. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Five to one. Thank you. All right. Um, approve curriculum maps for elementary music, orchestra, and high school facts. Mrs. Hummer and Mrs. Bell, sorry, I forget to always say that. Well, uh, we are here tonight to bring you 26 maps. Our, our curriculum committee of over 60 plus teachers have been working feverishly to get these done and we are really seeing the end in sight here for this school year so we're excited about that and we do have a few people um, from these committees here in the audience so I want to make sure that we recognize them. We have Jana Bamman and Rebecca Stevenson for music. They're here. An orchestra we have Tyrese Mendez. We had Avery Ayersberry earlier, and um, we have Donna Deaver from uh, the high school facts department, and Shannon O'Connor, who has worked with almost all of this, these groups, and she is present as well. And they're here to um, just be recognized, and so you can see that they've put in a ton of work. Uh, not only just they've gotten release time with subs to, to work, but they work independently and then they also work like before school, after school, just wherever it makes most sense for each individual person to do those maps. And so we really recognize them and thank you all for coming here and they're here to answer any questions that we can't answer for you as well. So tonight for elementary, we have our first through sixth grade um, vocal music maps to approve and we also have fifth and sixth grade orchestra. Then for the middle school, we have 7th and 8th grade orchestra, which are electives. 
And for the high school, you can see the extensive list of all of our um, music offerings, as well as metal smithing, painting, some of our art options, sculptures, um, cooking for life, culinary essentials, family studies, and human growth and development. So I'll speak a little bit about our elementary vocal music maps for grades one through six. Each of those maps that you were shared a copy um, really focus on the idea of creating, performing, and responding to um, music um, within the arts. And through different units of beat, recognizing strong and weak beats and steady beats, as well as meters of two, three, and four, dynamics and tempo, learning um, vocabulary like forte and um, mezzo forte and crescendo and decrescendo, um, allegro for fast, and um, how do I, am I doing okay? Adagio. Adagio for slow. <laughs> They're looking at me, I'm like, I think I know these terms. Um, unlike the art terms last week, but last time we were here. Anyway, um, our students will also be talking about rhythm and notation, both in treble um, and bass clef. They'll learn some musical history as well as um, world music, um, different styles and genres of music from classical, jazz, pop, and world. Um, they also, as you will see, are gonna be having instruments. We have some now, but we would like to grow our instrument exposure for students. Um, and so we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, with each of those instruments, learning the techniques that it takes in order to successfully play those instruments. Um, they talk about composition. We do some folk dancing, um, and we also focus on concert performance. So you can see in the picture here, we love that our musicians are able to perform, and many of those performances happen in our district auditorium, and it is um, a lot of work on behalf of our um, teachers, but also our students, and such a showcase of their work. So um, each grade level map that you saw for first through sixth has these units, but they're all different based on their state standards and what's appropriate at the, their grade level. And that same scaffolding approach happens in our orchestras as well. So we have fifth and sixth grade orchestra that really starts to talk about note reading and some of those skills. And by the time they get in the seventh and eighth grade, they're talking about bowing technique. They're talking about rehearsal etiquette. They're really starting to um, talk about the composers that they're playing their, their music and the history behind those composers. They're talking about shifting and tone production and moving down, down the line. And then eighth grade, they're still working on those skills, but just at a more age appropriate level. So now they've got a master, they're talking about vibrato now. And so just really kind of hone tuning those skills that they've learned all the way through. When they slide up into the um, high school experience, most of the kids start in a concert orchestra, and then based on that, they audition to be in a different class. Either that's chamber, which you approved last year, or symphonic or philharmonic. Those are different classes based on their skills and the makeup of their goals and what they really want to do. Do they want to perform in a large setting or do they really like the ensemble environment that they, they play in? So those are all based on the enrollment and skills that they try, but all of those things are still doing that repetition of bowing techniques with all of the different levels. The music, they, I didn't put it up here because I didn't want it to be confusing, but the music is graded, if you will. And so it might be a grade level two, and that doesn't mean second grade. That just is the rating scales that they're using to play the music. In each one of those classes, they play harder levels of music, and the, um, the uh, teachers pull those pieces out based on what the students are ready for playing, and that varies from year to year in different groups. So that's kind of a continuum of the vocal music and the orchestra. We had band last time, which also worked on that continuum. And that's something that I'm so proud of our staff for doing. They're not in isolation. They don't just practice, they don't just develop the kids while they're there in that one grade level and then move them on and hope for success. They all work together. They talk to each other, vocal music, choir, 
band and orchestra all work, have a really good working relationship, which makes our uh, performing arts group really special. Our art, these are the last groups of our art that aren't directly related to a CTE pathway. So like Mrs. Avery Ayersberry talked about drawing and graphic arts design, those are in some CTE pathways which we'll see in a later adoption. But these are the last ones. Our metal smithing, uh, one, two, and three, also are experiences where some of it's repeated, but then each time they get a little bit different. So in metal smithing one, they talk about cold connections, then hot connections where they're soldering things and then talking about stone setting. And this is just a random picture, but that idea of taking metal and making it into some sort of art, either jewelry or just fun things to look at, that's what they're doing. In the second class, they're, they're starting to incorporate chains. They're talking about tab settings so that they can place stones in those settings. And then they're talking about etching and narrative art. The three and four classes are really more about experience and interest at that point. They still have to practice the skills they learned in one and two, but they start really honing in their skills. They design things, they build them, um, they marry all those metals together. And then in the fourth year, they actually design a project. They create a contract with the teacher. They develop a timeline of when they think they're going to get their project done. And they basically just kind of practice um, getting a task and starting all the way till the end and, and doing that. So that's a cool experience for our metal smithing classes. Painting scaffolded the exact same way. Uh, they, they basically primarily focus on oils, watercolors, and acrylics through all the way through, but they, they get more in depth. So that picture there is a painting one. So a lot of our, our kids are starting to learn the idea of landscaping and blending those colors together. They eventually learn what um, texture looks like, either physically or just making it look like that visually. And then they're also talking about still life and how to do that from different observations. Again, they'll still have that fourth level class where they do their own individual products. And then we also have a suite of classes within our sculpture, and that's where they make a lot of 3D art, whether that's 3D printing or corrugated paper or uh, just a host of different mediums that they get to use. Uh, but they, they, they look at different tools and techniques like clay and wire and paper and other just found objects to make that. And then they always do something, like Mrs. Hummer said, about reflection. They're talking about how they look at the work of themselves, they might look at work of others and they reflect on that and they critique themselves. And that's part of the process of the products that they make. Um, then our last grouping, because it made the most sense, um, was to slide in our facts classes because Mrs. Devers worked so very, very hard on those. And you actually, she was here exactly one year ago presenting one of her maps. And then we slid in these other, she, she had them ready to go and they've been sitting in the hopper for a while. So she teaches four classes that I'm presenting tonight. One is cooking for life, where they talk about food and the effects that has on life. They talk about nutrition and nutritional challenges, food deficiencies, dietary guidelines, things like that. Um, then they talk about food choices and preparation, like different cooking methods and sanitation skills. They talk, they talk about physical activity and social and mental health and how all of that is related to their nutrition and wellness. And then they talk about personal wellness, like body imaging and fad diets and food addictions and eating disorders. And students have the opportunity to take culinary essentials, where they talk about uh, chemical and physical and biological hazards that impact food. They talk about food Ill illnesses in Kansas, food safety, and common food allergens. Then they get to do some fun stuff, like they start talking about food service and the methods and the table settings and the different reasons for table settings. They talk about what personal food choices affect nutritional needs. And then they look at serving styles like fast food, fast casual, casual dining, and fine dining. So the kids get the, all of the variety of those experiences in those courses. 
Along that pathway, she also teaches a class for family studies. And in that curriculum map, you'll read a lot more. Um, I kind of, there was so much great content in there. I just kind of summarized. So um, the family unit, she talks about parenting process, meeting the needs of children, family relationships, and the family and society. And then the last class that she teaches is human growth and development, where she's talking about the principles of human development, influences impacting human development in children, interpersonal skills and relationships within a family, and working with children in early childhood. And that class actually is also, in, these classes are also embedded into our teaching pathway as well. They cross over some so that we're talking about that early childhood piece for uh, teaching education experiences for our students. So with that being said, that is the 26 maps. And if we get approval of those 26, you will officially hit 99 maps in one year. I'm so excited. 99. So, yes. Just a quick question. Are any of the food um, classes, do those cross over out into the greenhouse? And do they do anything as far as like growing herbs or seeing the fertilization and see how this spinach does better than that? You well, talk. The greenhouse hasn't even been opened yet. No. Okay. That hasn't even been opened. That's being opened. I mean, Soon. I know. Oh, do you, do you do anything there with grow lights or no? no? We don't have the room. Okay. I have the, I call the smallest, biggest classroom you'll ever see. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. What is fast casual? You mentioned that. I don't, is that, okay. I was like, I've never heard that term before. So, okay. That would be why. Fast casual? Oh. Good to know. Had no idea. New term. I learned something new today. Great. Any other questions from anyone? I think these are amazing. I'm so happy to see all the arts and music. And um, I, I love it. I love seeing our students just excel in all of these arts. I was flipping through K-State's music program and happened to see one of the Chez students, um, you know, Fluke, who is doing her recital coming up on April 16th. And I was like, I know her, and she's still in music. And it's just really cool um, to see that and, and just knowing that, you know, last week was our Heights on Display and and seeing those talented students, amazing, amazing work. So, um, so thank you all who's here for, you know, just being a part of this and helping our students grow even further. And Mrs. B Deaver, you will be very missed uh, with your retiring and all the years that you've put into it. So the next person has some big shoes to fill, but um, thank you very much for every, everything that you all did for this. So with that, do we have a motion to approve? Who, who moved? Sarah. <laughs> so moved by Sarah, seconded by Lauren. All in favor? Five zero. Thank you so much. Five, six. six. Sorry. Gosh. I need to go home and take a nap. Failure leads to success. Six zero. All right. Um, approve elementary music resource. This is going to be Mrs. Hummer. You are correct. Yay. Now that we have approved those elementary um, vocal music maps, we would like to request some resources and your approval to spend textbook funds in order to purchase our Quaver Ed Music. This is a six-year digital license. Our staff have been utilizing this with students um, in our previous rounds, but we would like to do this all the way through. That six-year term got us a discount until our next curriculum adoption when, art, when music would be up again. And we are also requesting some um, various instruments to be purchased through West Music. And I have to say on behalf of our elementary people, they worked very diligently together to look at what do we currently have, 
What do we need more of perhaps because of how many students we have in our classrooms in order so everyone has access? But also how can we grow um, and give our students experiences with different types of instruments as well? So you will notice as you look at that um, and as you saw in their curriculum maps, what Tecumseh South needed might not be exactly the same thing as Chez, but we wanted to make sure that it, we made it equitable across all four buildings. Um, and we used the resources that they currently have to just offset that. So um, with that, it did come to um, the figure you see there, $64,969.19 for those quotes. Um, and we would recommend approval of using textbook funds in order to make that happen. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? I move approval. Moved by Lauren. Do I have a second? Seconded by Rocky. All in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Um, approve memorandum of understanding with Shawnee County Sheriff's Office. Mr. Hallisey. This is the agreement um, that we were looking at um, with the uh, cooperative uh, collaboration that we have with the Shawnee County Sheriff's Department on uh, our cameras. So uh, we've received a couple of extra questions and, and a request to have uh, a portion of that vetted uh, by our legal team. Uh, and so I would recommend that we table that uh, until the May 6th meeting. It won't put us behind anything. Austin's still working on the equipment, uh, and so we would be able to do both the order the equipment and approve this at the next meeting, uh, and it wouldn't put us behind any if, if we do that. So my recommendation would be to go ahead and table that for tonight and then bring it back to the 6th meeting. Any so questions? I would... Make, that Make motion. a motion. Okay, uh, so motioned by Lauren to table this until our May 6th meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Christina. All in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Um, approve our 2024 2025 partnership agreement with Kansas Children's Service League. Mr. Hallisey. This is the annual agreement uh, with KCSL. Uh, regarding the Center for Restorative Education. Um, this is a really successful program that we have for students who are unable to continue their uh, education, primarily at the high school. Um, it is uh, a program that has wraparound services of, of counseling, social work, things like that to help students be successful. So it's, it's been a very good program for us. Um, we're glad to be a part of that. We recommend uh, renewing for another year for that. Do we have any questions for Mr. Hollisey? I do. Yes. Um, so they reserve the spots for us, and there's a per seat cost. Is that a we pay that cost for the year, whether we use the seat or not? That is correct. And if different students, can, can they come in and out, and it's still that same? The, the float, yes. Okay. Thank you. Good questions. Do we have a motion for approval? Oh, yep. Of the eight seats, do, like this year, have we had the seats filled the whole year, or do we? we we've had seats? the we've had the seats filled the whole year, and and usually a waiting list. Okay. So yeah. Thanks, Christina. I'll move that we approve it, and I'll second. Moved by Christina, seconded by Sarah. All in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Whew. Approved capacity study, Mr. Hallisey. All right. Kansas Statute 72-3123, open enrollment. Um, there are some things that we've had to do with that. We've known this is coming for a couple of years. Um, by May 1st, uh, we are required by statute to uh, determine our capacity. Um, by June 1st, we need to post that capacity on our website. So when we went back, we looked at a lot of different factors. Uh, we looked at our current enrollment. Uh, we looked at our building enrollment projections, capacity limits. Um, an important factor in, in that is what are our target 
class sizes across the board, both, both for our title schools and our non-title schools, across the grade level. Um, we know that class sizes are impacted by many different factors, uh, including but not limited to the number of students in that attendance center's population, the number of tracks per grade level at each building, individual and collective student needs in each individual classroom also uh, uh, impact the capacity of being able to, to place students in there uh, successfully. Support services available, district programs located in individual schools. There are several factors like that that we had to take into consideration. We've been having this discussion for the last year. We also know that we are crowded. We have program limitations and building limitations. Uh, it's tight in our elementary schools. Um, and and uh, that, that hasn't changed any. Um, so we had to look at that. Staffing is a headwind for our ability to accept additional out-of-district students. It is becoming increasingly difficult to staff both classified and certified positions as we move forward. We are still growing. We're still adding about 50 to 70 houses a year. Not all of those are producing um, children and school-aged children, uh, but we're still having that growth. We also know that we are expected that growth factor to continue. Um, we're looking at between 1% and 2% growth factor is what we think. We calculated 1% into this one. Um, we also know that inflation and supply chain constraints have also been a headwind. As those are start to be solved, we will start to see a pickup in that. And one of the other factors that we looked at when we did the population study and looked at that was what kind of growth are we going to see in the local economy of, of all northeast Kansas. We know the Gigafactory, you know, to our east is, is coming online over the next few years. We also know that um, they were talking about uh, adding and building at Forbes. That actually came out in the paper this weekend. So we're going to have additional uh, jobs and, and economic growth in the community, which is really good for our community and growth, but it makes it kind of challenging for us to keep up with that. One of the other factors that has really negatively impacted our ability to keep up with some of the growth that we expect is the loss of bond and interest aid. And bond and interest aid, as you know, back when we passed our last bond issue uh, 10 years ago, uh, the district paid 51%, the state picked up 59%. They infused equity for taxpayers, equity for student opportunities across the board. They eliminated that. Our next bond issue our portion will go up to 88%. Our costs more than double. That makes it very difficult for us to continue to build to meet our own needs, let alone outside and continue to accept. Shawnee Heights has had a long, proud tradition of when we have the capacity, we have accepted out-of-district students. We have done that. We've continued to do that. But you know over the last three years, we have had to reduce that number. As we've seen more growth internally, we have had to reduce the number of students we've accepted outside of that. This law actually makes it a little more difficult uh, for us to continue to do that um, because of, of it takes away some of our flexibility for that. The other thing is we all plan to, to do a bond issue next year. We think that'll be successful, but even when we're able to do that, we're still three years out from being able to bring online facilities. So that means we still have three years of growth coming up that we have to calculate in to whether or not we can accept out of district students. So when we started looking at that, and then we looked at our specialized programs that serve uh, some of the students that uh, Dr. O'Brien talked about um, uh, across the board that, that we look at, they're already over capacity at some of those, in fact, in most of those. We also have limitations for our own students with some of our electives at the high school. While our class sizes are really good, uh, some of our more popular electives, we have waiting lists for those. So it makes it very difficult for us to accept additional out-of-district students uh, when we're struggling to serve the students that we have now. And we expect that number to continue to slowly increase over the next three to four years. You also remember from our um, enrollment analysis that uh, the growth in years 5 through 10 are even higher. Uh, we have several um, housing developments planned or in the planning stages that can add a large number of houses. As the economy picks up, uh, that will continue to even be more growth. So um, 
Right now we have good, steady, slow growth, but we also have really limited capacity. So when you look at that and you combine those together and you look at the number of students that we currently serve and our capacity to continue to serve those students, um, our recommendation is that we are at capacity or slightly over in all the buildings and that we do not have moving to next year the room or capacity to add additional out of district enrollment. That doesn't impact the kids that we currently have. Um, we expect them to be students and remain students in good standing. There may be policy uh, and statute thrown into the mega bill that, that does finance at the end that may impact some of that, but, but we anticipate that uh, we're going to have all of our students back next year. But we recommend moving forward to next year that we do not accept additional out-of-district enrollment. So that is our recommendation right now. It is a large and complicated study. I'd be glad to uh, answer any questions you guys might have, if I can. Christina? Um, can you give us just a ballpark figure? I know we've talked about this before. How many out-of-district uh, students we have, like a percentage, what we currently serve? Uh, and if you don't know a number, that's fine, I, but just... Uh, accurately, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I, that's fine. Yeah, over, overall, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? No. Sarah? I've talked over you at least once. It's okay. My question's hopefully easy. We will just make this review and determination every year then going forward unless the legislature changes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have to do this every year. We'll look at it next year. Something could change. Um, something could change and, and we, we have additional capacity. Um, when we eventually pass a bond, some pieces of facilities may come online a little quicker than others that may impact our capacity. Um, uh, we may have things like that. Um, uh, so this is a year uh, to year decision that the board will need to make moving forward as long as the statute is in existence. Lauren? My question is related to this, but not specifically about this. Um, <clears throat> and it comes late because I, I read the packet late. So really I'm making a data request, not specifically uh, asking you to answer this question right now. But I would be interested to know approximately how many hours went into putting this document together and approximately how many of our staff contributed to this. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we can get that for you. Yeah. Any other questions? Do we have a motion? I, oh, I do. Rocky? I have Sorry. One question. <clears throat> I'm looking at the specialized program student enrollment capacity and it says we're servicing 403, I think, students on that and our capacity is only 330. So I guess how are we accomplishing that? And then how are we, if we are, are we meeting all the ob obligated, um, I guess, minutes and required minutes of, of all? Of, of yeah, my, Rocky, we, we are able to, to meet that. If, if In a perfect world, we would like to have more of those. Um, so, uh, Kristen, the, what we're talking about is some of your programs and the numbers that we talked about, and I can get you that so that you can talk more about that. very specialized programs in the classroom. 
It also includes um, Center for Restorative Ed, which is what you just approved through um, KCSL. Um, it also includes Orion, et cetera. So um, these aren't all special education um, programs. So to answer Rocky, it, it, um, it's not all special education, and the um, capacity and what we are serving all of our minutes. Um, one of the things that um, the capacity study that we did notice is that some of these are based on the December 1 count that I just um, went over with you. If you look at our total students at, um, as of this moment, we're up 50 students. So what I want you to understand is you may have heard numbers that were reflected in December 1, but now we're even higher. Um, we're higher than that. Um, but you have to look at our, our highest point in the year by in terms of capacity. I don't know if I yeah, <laughs> so so I, the, the, the developmentally delayed, for instance, it says our total count is 140, our capacity is 120. I assume we're meeting the needs of our students there, but why, I guess if we're able to meet it at 140, why, why isn't our capacity at 140? Or is it just because we're not maybe optimally meeting it? You know, is it, if, if we right-sized it, it would be at 120? Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else, Sarah? I think this is probably a softball question, hopefully. On the section that talks about the target class size, so what happens in the classrooms? Is there an accommodation for the teachers when their classroom is quite a bit over their target class size, or what do we do about yeah, that? Yeah, sure, and depending on the needs, Sarah, so we'll, that, that, that's where adding para support, um, those kind of things, the extra supports uh, from, from other staff to help with that. So uh, that, that's a key on that. Um, to reiterate Kristen's point, though, yeah, not all of these are SPED positions. Some of these were support or at risk um, that we would really like to expand. We would love to have more sharp um, um, placement uh, available, uh, more CRE placements available. Certainly that's a program that we would really like to expand in partnership with that. Uh, and the bond issue may bring up some opportunities to do those kind of things. But yeah, uh, for the SPED side of it, we are required by law to make those accommodations. And so uh, we, we meet those requirements in minutes. It's not easy sometimes. Um, and, and part of the building uh, and the bond issue will be not just adding classroom space, but adding workspace to do more modern work with students uh, in a better way too. So um, that'll be part of that as well. Uh, that will reflect some of, of the things that we see in that report. And we approved 210 out of district students this year. Anyone else? I right. just would like, um, the middle school is going to be rough in the next couple of years because fifth and sixth grade classes are some of the largest classes coming up. So we're really going to be pushing the, the boundaries there. Those will be large. Um, and, and, and again, the capacity piece, uh, it's, it's really a reflection of how can we successfully work with students. You can force more people into a building and still feed them and things like that, but can you work successfully with them? Can you provide the opportunities they expect and deserve? And so that, that makes the, the capacity a, a little bit different and a little more complicated to, to configure. And so that, that's what we've done with this. Um, eventually, we would like to accept everybody who would like to come to Shawnee Heights. But right now, the demand far outstrips our ability to accommodate all the families that want to come. And, and we just, we're just not there. Um, uh, but it, it's a credit to the staff and the community that this is a place where, where people want to come. And, and so we, we appreciate that. 
with approval of this, are we painting ourselves into a corner if there is an exodus of students that either don't live in the district, that go back to their home district, or um, you know, for whatever reason leave the district? And we, I guess what I'm concerned about is, are, are we gonna potentially say, okay, we're gonna see a loss of funding because you know, we don't, are, don't have the expected enrollment and then we can't accept out of district Sure. students because so, of the passes. So, yeah, that's a great question, Rocky. So when we when we publish this on, on the website, here's our capacity, here's where we're at. Um, if, if, if we get to August, because it is hard to predict because we have so many people that will show up in August late, um, th these are projections. So if our projections are wrong or off, and let's say we don't have 100 kids that, that, that show up, and when we get there and we have that capacity, uh, we would have the ability to fill that up to what we determined our capacity would be. And, and, and so we would be able to do that. Uh, there would be some work. We'll see what happens uh, if there's any changes with that statute, uh, but we would look at that. Ms. Bell? I would also say that we do pre-enrollment each year, and that happens in May, I believe. Um, Carla Murray and Katie Davis are working on sending out SNAP codes to families before too long. So we would have a good idea of how many kids are returning um, for current staffing, uh, right now, staffing levels. So you could know potentially in June if you saw a mass exodus coming down the pike and then you could change that before the draft, when the lottery window, if, if that's what they're calling it, um, to make an adjustment there. Is that right, Mr. Hallisey? That's no? correct. Okay. Thank you. And then if we had to do this, is it the September 20th cutoff for our times to say, okay, now we're full with these yeah, limitations? I, so I, I think, Christine, any, when you got up to the level that we determined, here's our capacity, when you got there, you, you could stop then. You could continue to accept up to a certain date, but yeah, certainly after the 20th, you're not going to be able to, I think you would want a cutoff. Um, uh, date September 1st whatever it might be the 20th is the count date but right um, yes yeah, so when, when you reach capacity um, that, that that's it okay thank you and if I'm remembering correctly when we if we accept one student and that student has family siblings in other grades then they're all accepted is that correct well uh, that <laughs> Maybe, uh, but we don't think so. Oh, okay. We, we think that um, they would be prioritized, um, that if we have capacity, we would need to do that. But I don't think it, you are forced to accept them if you don't have capacity in those other areas. Okay. Is, is the last interpretation that we heard. Uh, and there are some gray areas to this one. So I'll leave okay. it at that. All right. Thank you. With all of those questions being answered... Do we have a motion? And, and for clarity, the motion would be to approve no additional out-of-district students for next year is what you would be approving. So we are at capacity uh, across the district. Motion by Christy. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Sarah. All in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Discussion items, high school weight room and aerobics room. Mr. Hallisey. Well, the, the flood was certainly very unpleasant and, and it's been really inconvenient for everybody. The, the students have been excellent and the staff in, in working around that. Um, uh, the areas that were hardest hit were the areas where, where the, we had the pipe burst at, right? The aerobics room and the weight room sustained the most damage. But it's also created an opportunity for us to, to remodel that area and modernize it a little bit. It's been the same for, you know, 35 years. Um, and, and this is a chance for us to update that facility. Uh, it's also a chance for us to update it at a cheaper cost. Um, we could do that in the future. We could remodel that area two or three years down the road as part of the bond issue, but we could do it now cheaper the other thing is, too, that would free up resources for the bond that we could apply to other needs across the district. So um, in sitting down and talking to the high school about some of the changes they would like to see um, in working with Mr. West and, and um, uh, the staff over there, uh, 
the proposal would be uh, to do a couple of different things. Um, they would like to combine the weight room and the aerobics room, um, eliminate the wall between those to create a much larger space. Um, they would then create a, a separate aerobics room with new equipment and updated equipment in there uh, for that. Um, put a synthetic floor throughout there that would absorb shock uh, and make it a safer, more level playing uh, and, and exercise space across the board, um, which would be nice. Um, then uh, put the racks along the wall, uh, update those. Um, there would be an in, indoor turf runway um, for exercise um, uh, across there that they would utilize in that much longer uh, space and then updated equipment to, across the board with that. So it's a pretty extensive remodel of that area, but it's also a, a, a really good update uh, that would modernize that space for the next 20 years. Um, we're still throwing out ideas. We're, we got additional ideas from staff today that we'll put in there. Uh, our friends at HTK have, have put together a concept drawing of what it might look like. Um, uh, we're throwing changes in there. Um, and new ideas that we're looking at. Uh, what we hope to have to do is, is have a budget um, and uh, uh, better uh, 3D renderings for you uh, when we come back on May 6th. Uh, but that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a good change. It's one that will really benefit all the students of the high school. Um, and, and it's a really nice upgrade for that space uh, in those in those two areas, so that's kind of where we're at now. What we're looking at, um, and and we're coming across new ideas and things that we would like to do with that uh, every day. So that that's kind of where we're at now. But we're glad to entertain any questions you may have. Just looking back on the um, classroom size and everything, it looks like weightlifting and phys ed is full. Would this make any additional space to enlarge classes or no? I think you'll be able to accommodate more students with this. Yeah, and, and you're right, Christine. Th those are really full. Those are waiting list classes. And that's an so. important thing in this day and age with exercise and everything. So Yeah, I think okay. we'll be able to serve more kids and, and, and also safer um, uh, because those are really active classes um, with, with that equipment and things. So um, I, I, I think we'll make positive progress on that as well. I've heard from some students that they're interested in, um, besides aerobics, um, but like yoga and stretching, um, bands, the bands that they use to stretch, and just wondering if that has been considered in any of this. I, I haven't, that hasn't popped up in any conversations that we've had for that. Um, again, uh, you have large areas in this space that that'll be open that you could utilize for that. If the floor is right, I don't know. Do yeah, the floor, have have the, floor, special... the floor will be level, it'll be okay. synthetic, so it'll absorb shock, so it'll actually be pretty good for those kind of things. Okay, there were, yeah, interesting conversation with some some students last week, so. Yes, and especially have, the, have, have them share those ideas with, uh, especially uh, um, Coach Oshel and Swift and, and uh, Danielle, that'll, uh, they're the primary ones that are going to be utilizing that space. So, um, but yeah, they, 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 I think that that open space would be uh, very conducive to that. Okay, Christina, Rosa, just to follow up on that: Is this something that could be used as club space after class hours? I don't know if there was a yoga club or if there was some other physical education club that wasn't an actual school class. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, yeah. I think okay. I think it'll be pretty busy. I think it'll be used a lot after school too, and uh, other times. But I mean, the space is is pretty conducive to that. So I think it'd have a lot of uses. Do our staff use this equipment in area workout areas also? I, I, th I think yeah, it, it would be open to them. I don't know how many currently go in and use that Rocky, but but yeah, I would hope that all the staff would want to go in and use that and utilize that on after school, before school, weekends, um, all those kind of things. 
I know there would be some added expense that we hadn't planned. Um, when we get kind of deeper into the details, would we be able to consider maybe phasing it so that we do some of it that we could potentially afford or plan for now and then phase some of it in with the bond so that we're not maybe putting carts before other horses that have been waiting in line longer? We, we could. Um, I, I, I really think, Sarah, that we won't have to do that. Um, one of the frustrations with the supply chain is that um, sometimes we've ordered things and they've been delayed coming in. And so we have quite a backlog of equipment on order that, that is not going to arrive this fiscal year. And that puts us quite a bit of money ahead um, that we can easily just make that expense when it comes out. Um, and, and so we think uh, that we will be able to um, shell those expenses uh, when those items do come in and and we'll be able to do the upgrades now um, and then this is a project that's going to take us into the summer uh, the goal is to have this all done for the kids when they return in August because um, there's quite a bit of work and remodeling that needs to be done um, so we'd have to get busy on it but but we want to have that done for the kids in August when they return so but we think financially we're going to be okay and able to do that right now without putting anything off uh, on that so any other questions great discussion um superintendent's report mr hallisey negotiations um coming up this thursday so uh dinner 5 30 negotiations at six so we'll get started with that that's always good um staff appreciation week uh coming up uh, uh the week of uh uh, May, uh, I think, 6th through 11th, uh, 10th. Um, May 8th would be the big one. Um, that's, the, that's the cinnamon roll day. So uh, wherever you want to be, we have some times at all the buildings, uh, and everybody looks forward to seeing you guys and, and uh, having cinnamon rolls. And, and so we're going to be doing that on uh, May 8th. So uh, if you can uh, be there, please let us know. And I think Tiffany's going to coordinate that, and uh, she'll get you down on, on what building and where we need help at, and hopefully we'll give out uh, a lot of cinnamon rolls that day. So uh, that's coming up. Uh, tomorrow morning is going to be one of those unusual mornings. We don't have a whole lot of early morning thunderstorms, but right now they're telling us we're going to have a lot of thunderstorms in the morning rolling in. So families out there, please be aware um, uh, that that's going to be going on. Give yourself a little bit of extra time uh, going to work, coming to school, uh, and stay alert uh, for any uh, weather-related alerts that come out uh, and uh, make sure we all get there safe tomorrow. Uh, but we'll be watching that weather pretty close uh, overnight and as we head into tomorrow morning. That is it. Wow. Okay. Questions, comments from the board members? Christine. I would just like to give a big shout-out to all the artists that had something in the heights of display it was absolutely amazing to see all of the different things that all of our students are doing and the fact that we have this available for our students. It was just amazing. I would absolutely say the same thing. Um, I think one of our favorite discussions that night was with the um, special education students and um, didn't realize they were making items for us to purchase for a trip that they're planning to go on. And um, not that I can get my dog to wear his cute little handkerchief thing around his neck, um, but it's, it's there waiting for him when, when I can fight him and wrestle him down. Um, but the other dog's fine, and we got some toys, and it was amazing. And just seeing the work that... Um, that those teachers do uh, for those students is pretty amazing, and, and talking to those students was a lot of fun. So the art was amazing. Um, so many things I wish I could buy. I, I just, ugh, every time I'm like, I want to buy that, and then I get so upset that you can't. Um, but you could buy your T-Bird earrings that night in case anybody needed any. So um, other than that, anyone else? Rosa. Yes, Lauren. I will add to that uh, I always say heights on display is one of my favorite nights of the year because we mm -hmm. have spectacular artists so much talent um, across so many different mediums it's amazing and I know that uh, 
There was a calculus table set up showing all the, the art that they were creating. Um, as a sister to a mathematician, <laughs> I, I've heard that there's beauty in math, but I don't quite follow that. But I got to see some of that on that table. But um, I was also st just stunned by Katie Eller's work. Um, in fact, I took several yes. pictures of her work. So I'm, I'm so incredibly proud that she's getting this honor. And I wanted to take a moment um, to elaborate a little bit more on her art and what she said her uh, inspiration was, because I, I have studied a little bit about this myself. And what makes it so impactful is the fact that <clears throat> It truly is a crisis within this population. Uh, that one study found that an average of 40% of women involved in trafficking identified as an American Indian or an Alaska Native or First Nations, yet Native women represent 10% or less of the general population. So the statistics are astounding when it comes to this population. However, that also comes with an asterisk because a lot of the data is sparse. A lot of the crimes go unreported, they go uninvestigated, they are unsolved. Um, and so I was truly in awe of this piece of artwork, particularly mm -hmm. coming from a high school student, um, because it represents this, this awareness, this movement to bring awareness to this population is not just about finding justice for these women, but it's also about shining a light on the inequities um, established in deeply rooted systemic failures that we have to correct. Um, and so I found a lot of hope in seeing some of this stuff represented in the artwork of our students um, that perhaps there is some change coming ahead. So kudos to Katie for that. 100%. And I love that we are getting back to recognizing all of our students, including our artists and musicians and it's there's so much more and we appreciate our sports but um, but there's so much more to be able to recognize uh, what our students are doing um, whether it's math club or art um, so all of those so we're just going to continue to have them come uh, to our next few board meetings so that we can recognize them at all elementary middle school and high school levels so I'm very excited to be able to recognize them for all of their achievements. Christina? Just to follow up on that, on the capacity study, waiting lists, ceramics, metalsmithing, and painting. So it's, it's a popular thing. Mm -hmm. So just pointing that out. Yes. Anyone else? Rocky, you're awfully quiet this evening. Nope. I'm in a food coma from uh, oh. dinner. <laughs> Uh, eat, eat too much cake and brownies. So thank you for the PTO for, for doing that. All right. Well, with that, um, I move that we go into executive session to discuss an individual employee pursuant to non-elected personnel exception under Kansas Open Meetings Act. And the meeting will resume in the boardroom. I'm looking for a clock after 20 minutes, but I don't know what time it is. We'll resume at 8.47? Oh, we will resume at 9.05. We'll go fast. Um, and we will need Mr. Hirsch and Mr. Hallisey, and you guys will tell us where we're meeting. Do I have a second? Seconded by Sarah. All in favor? 6-0. Thank you.
All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved <laughs> by Rocky. Seconded by Christy. All in favor?